Imagine you are Vladimir Putin in the early 2000s. After the overthrow of communism, you are trying to lead a country with a new capitalist system. You are appointed as president by Boris Yeltsin. As Boris Yeltsin's successor, your aim is to continue the project of decommunization and the transition to Russian capitalism. So of course you want to do what all successful capitalist countries do, get foreign investment and build trade relationships. Therefore, it only makes sense to integrate with the Western capitalist world. That's where the money's at. To make sure you are economically integrated in the West, you need to join NATO, the military alliance spearheaded by the USA, the sole remaining superpower. If you can't beat them, join them, right? To try and join NATO, you make efforts to please the country that really runs NATO, the United States. But what if all your efforts to please the US don't work? What if you keep trying to build a relationship but the other side makes no effort to do the same? What if they keep neglecting your concerns and even try to intimidate you by continuing to expand their military close to your country's border? You got rid of communism, so if you have a capitalist economy now, how come your country is not allowed to join the club of capitalist nations? Imagine how your Russian citizens would react to seeing their country constantly get disrespected by the US empire. Plus, the living standards of Russian citizens have significantly dropped since the fall of the Soviet Union and the implementation of capitalism. So they either become nostalgic for the old Soviet order, or yearn for a new ideology that will give them meaning and purpose. You, Vladimir Putin, do not want to be seen as weak by your people. But becoming enemies with the USA could make things a lot worse for the Russian economy and your national security. So you want to avoid direct confrontation. You tolerate losing most of Eastern Europe to Western influence and NATO expansion. But what if the US military expands to countries right by your country's border, like Georgia and Ukraine, where missiles can hit your country in seconds? Oh no, now that would be a step too far for Mr. Putin. The dream of a peaceful partnership with the USA is now officially dead. In these circumstances, if you were the president of the Russian Federation, how could you possibly maintain a pro-Western ideology after all your efforts to integrate with the West have failed? How would you explain this to your voters? So you need a new ideology that coincides with your new anti-Western stance. And by now you've been in power for almost a decade, so you need a new ideology and purpose anyways to justify your regime's existence. But how can Russia differentiate itself from the liberal West if it shares a similar economic system? You can't turn back to Soviet socialism because you're a capitalist, remember? A capitalist with many billionaire friends. So what is one ideology that has proven to work when it comes to controlling people? Good old conservative nationalism. And Russia certainly has a history of that. So instead of framing your opposition to the United States as an opposition to capitalism, like the USSR did, how about framing your state ideology in opposition to liberalism? A civilizational struggle between Russian Orthodox traditional values versus decadent to liberal individualism. That will differentiate you and your country from the Western Bloc without having to embrace a radically different economic system. And conservative nationalism is one of the oldest tricks in the book. Even right-wingers in the West fall for it all the time. And even better, you can frame your oppositional stance towards the USA as anti-imperialist. This will not only help you garner moral support among the population, but also to gain the support of many countries around the world who have also been victimized by the US empire, particularly in Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. With this, you won't just get support from conservative right-wingers, but also some leftists, who are supposed to be anti-imperialists. And even though you actually have imperialist interests of your own, how can the enemy criticize you when their track record of imperialism is far worse? So you frame your imperialistic actions as defensive. That's the power of ideology and framing. This video is a story of Putin and the Kremlin's changing state ideology, and its relation to the gradual fallout between Russia and the USA. How did Russia under Putin go from aspiring to join NATO and wanting to integrate with the West, to then becoming an arch enemy of the USA fighting a proxy war with NATO? What do Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin want? What do they want in the Ukraine? Does Putin want to rebuild the Soviet Union? How about the Tsarist Empire? These are questions that will be explored throughout this video. There is one thing that most scholars of modern Russia can agree on. The Putin we know today is very different from the Putin of the early 2000s. But how so? And more importantly, why? Is it because Putin simply became more crazy over time? 
Or maybe it's more complicated than that. The heightened tensions between Russia and the USA over the past few years can make it easy to forget that relations between Russia and the West weren't always like this. This dramatic worsening of relations is often assumed by many to be rooted in an ingrained Soviet hostility towards the West. Yet a survey of Russia's foreign policy since the fall of communism reveals a very different picture. For much of the post-Soviet era, the Russian elite, including Putin, desired an alliance and even a partnership with the USA. They idealized economic and social integration with the West. Today, it is little known to the public that Putin used to champion a strong pro-Western sentiment and envisioned an economic and military alliance with the USA, which is evident if you look back at Putin's old statements before 2006. In a series of interviews before and after assuming the presidency in 2000, Putin described Russians as, quote, part of the Western European culture. No matter where our people live, in the Far East or in the South, we are Europeans. Putin expressed interest in joining NATO multiple times, as did his predecessor Boris Yeltsin. But this pro-Western vision was soon followed by resentment and frustration that Russia's desire to partner with the US was not shared by the US itself. The Kremlin started to become more and more frustrated that their desire to integrate with the West and potentially join NATO was not being reciprocated, as the US was reluctant to bring Russia into NATO. Why was the US reluctant to bring Russia into NATO? Well, we don't know for sure. But many have speculated that it's because Russia is too big and if it were to join NATO, the USA would need Russia's approval on some NATO policy decisions. And as we know all too well, the US prefers to be the sole superpower with it calling the shots. But despite not being able to join NATO, ties between Russia and the USA did not fall out yet. As for almost another decade, Russia continued to make efforts to cooperate with the USA and integrate with the West. However, over time, it became increasingly clear that integration with the West was a one-sided fantasy, and Russia's elite gradually abandoned this dream. Instead of capitulation to the West, the Russian elite under the leadership of Putin began a more strident defense of Russian national interests. This change in attitude among the Kremlin did not take place because of any return to Soviet thinking, as many Western pundits claim. Rather, this change in geopolitical relations was driven by a growing imbalance of power between Russia and the USA since the end of the Cold War. Russia's weakness after the dissolution of the USSR allowed the USA to expand its hegemony through the expansion of NATO. Now, you would think that NATO, a Cold War military alliance built to combat communism, would be dissolved after the fall of Soviet communism. But rather than leading to a dismantling of the NATO alliance, the fall of Soviet communism became an opportunity for the USA to further NATO expansion as a way to capitalize on their global imperialist ambitions. With the privatization of all those socialized assets in Eastern Europe, there was lots of opportunity for Western companies to profit. And by having these newly opened up countries within the umbrella of NATO, these imperialist corporate interests could be protected more strongly. But at the time, Russia wasn't angered by NATO expansion solely out of a fear of US hegemony, but also because they saw it as a betrayal of a promise that was made to them. At the end of the Cold War, Gorbachev and Soviet diplomats were promised by American and European authorities that NATO would not expand one inch eastward. Now, pro-Western mainstream media outlets often try to refute the fact that NATO promised not to expand one inch eastward by either denying it altogether or shifting the goalpost by saying, well, technically they promised the USSR, not the Russian Federation, so deal with it. But even with the fall of the USSR, you can find various leaked documents from diplomatic meetings which prove that leaders from the US, UK, France, and Germany did indeed make this promise in 1991 as well. However, only a couple of years after the Soviet Union ceased to exist, this promise was not kept, and the US has not stopped eastward NATO expansion since. Throughout the 90s and 2000s, Eastern European countries close by to Russia were brought into NATO, such as the Czech Republic, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Croatia, Slovenia, Albania, and Bulgaria. With American military bases and or American weapons being stationed within all of these new members of NATO, Russia became more and more threatened. On separate occasions, the USA also tried to bring in Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. But given their proximity to the Russian border, this was a step too far for the Kremlin. And as we will see, it did not end very well. This is by no means a defense of the Russian regime, which will become increasingly obvious throughout the video. 
It is undeniable that NATO expansion was a geopolitical decision with serious consequences. Even Joe Biden himself predicted in 1997 that eastward NATO expansion could trigger a major conflict. I think the one place where the greatest consternation would be caused in the short term for admission, having nothing to do with the merit and preparedness of the country to come in, would be to admit the Baltic states now in terms of NATO-Russian, U.S.-Russian relations. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance were it to be tipped in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction, I don't mean military, in Russia, it would be that. And even countless pro-Western international relations experts insisted that expanding near Russia's border was a recipe for disaster. It is really naive and short-sighted to assume that Putin is just crazy and not a rational actor and that NATO expansion isn't a real concern. Putin wasn't the first post-Soviet leader to express frustration with NATO expansion near Russia's border. Even Boris Yeltsin, the man often thought of as a pro-American pit bull, eventually became fed up with the US after a series of one-sided negotiations. As early as the mid-90s, Yeltsin wrote letters to his friend Bill Clinton, who helped him get re-elected thanks to a mixture of electoral fraud and financial meddling, asking why the US was so eager to expand NATO even though communism in the East was essentially over. The US continually refused to give Russia any guarantees as to the limits of NATO expansions. After the fall of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, the USA thought they were now in a unipolar world, where they could dictate countries to do whatever they want and not consider the objections of other nations, even when it came to a massive country like Russia. Boris Yeltsin became even more fed up with the Americans after the USA's 78-day bombing of Kosovo Yugoslavia in 1999. Yeltsin, once a pro-Western liberal who dreamt of a capitalist alliance with the USA, had an outburst of frustration in a 1999 speech, where he drunkenly pleaded that Russia will be back. Yeltsin's disillusionment with the USA's chauvinism and his frustration with Russia's crippled state would highly impact who he would choose as his successor. Nonetheless, in the face of growing US hegemony in the 90s and 2000s, Russia was still too weak to do anything to stop the ongoing NATO expansion and was willing to let it slide for now. So Russia under Putin in the early 2000s still actually made efforts to strengthen ties with the USA and the West. Up until around 2007, Putin actually had quite a warm relationship with President George W. Bush. In fact, Russia was the first country to offer assistance to the USA after 9-11, and even supported their war on terror in Afghanistan. In 2002, Putin even decided to close Soviet-era military bases in Cuba and Vietnam in an effort to please the United States. Although Russia still wasn't admitted to NATO, Moscow agreed to work closely with Washington to combat terrorism and other issues. However, US-Russia relations started to fracture again after the USA decided to opt out of a Cold War-era anti-ballistic missile treaty, an inconsiderate action which Russia saw as a potential risk to its national security. A few years later, Putin began voicing his concerns with NATO during his February 2007 address to the Munich Security Conference, where he openly criticized the USA for the Iraq War, the lack of cooperation on nuclear reduction, and most notably, eastward NATO expansion. This infamous speech displayed a fit of frustration that had been building up as Russia's attempts to forge a pragmatic alliance with the USA and develop ever closer economic ties with the West kept on failing. After more than a decade of putting up with NATO expansion and the USA's disregard for Russia's concerns, tensions really started to build up between Russia and the USA in 2008, when one of Russia's neighboring countries, Georgia, was invited to join the NATO alliance. This was something that the Kremlin simply could not accept. Georgia joining NATO would be an existential security crisis for Russia as it would mean that American missiles would be placed right on its border. So in 2008, Russia responded by invading Georgia to deter their neighboring country from joining NATO, an event that bears a lot of resemblance to the current situation between Ukraine and Russia today. And Russia's reaction is not that big of a surprise when considering how the USA reacted during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the Soviet Union placed missiles on Cuba to protect the revolution from the US Bay of Pigs invasion. The USA went ballistic and almost started World War III over it which scared the Soviets so much that they capitulated and pled for peaceful coexistence. Just imagine if Canada and Mexico were brought into a military alliance with China and had Chinese missiles placed on them that could hit the USA in seconds. Just imagine how the USA would react. 
With the partnership with the USA becoming more of a dead dream, Putin began taking a more nationalistic turn, gradually looking for a different state ideology to differentiate Russia from the West. But this ideological shift would be put on hold as Putin decided to take a break from the presidency for a little while. Towards the end of 2008, Putin appointed Dmitry Medvedev to the presidency, who would govern Russia as the head of state until 2012, while Putin served as prime minister. Medvedev is seen by many critics as a Putin puppet, as he didn't deviate very much from the United Russia Party line and supported very similar socio-economic policies, although he was slightly more liberal when it came to state repression, at least towards dissent which did not pose a threat to the regime. As Putin did in the early 2000s, Medvedev also made efforts to appease the USA and to build a stronger relationship that would benefit Russia economically. Putin decided to take a break from the presidency and appoint Medvedev for various reasons, chiefly among them being that Putin did not want to be seen as a dictator, and he believed that Medvedev would give Russia a new liberal face that would be less threatening to the West and foreign investors. During Medvedev's administration, Russia signed a nuclear arms reduction treaty with the USA and continued to try to normalize relations with the West. So as you can see, at this time the Kremlin still made efforts to improve relations with the West despite the Georgia conflict and NATO eastward expansion. It was still in their best interest to do so. However, the dream of Western integration and normalized US-Russia relations officially died in 2014, when the US and Russia fell out over Ukraine. As far back as the early 2000s during the nationalist protests of the so-called Orange Revolution in Ukraine, Putin repeatedly warned the USA against expanding military aid to Ukraine and trying to bring them into NATO. But it wasn't until the protests of the 2014 Maidan Revolution in Ukraine when tensions really started to get hot. When the Ukrainian president Yanukovych, who had pro-Russia stances, was deposed and replaced with a pro-Western leader following a massive protest which the Kremlin accused of being supported by the US and EU. In response, Putin ordered the annexation of Crimea, a region with an ethnic Russian majority. After Crimea was reclaimed back into Russian hands, the Kremlin faced tough sanctions from the USA and other Western countries, although these same countries continued to buy that cheap Russian petrol in the meantime. Ever since then, US-Russia relations have been in a very tumultuous state. And even though the Trump administration established a warmer relationship with Russia, Trump eventually cowered to pressure from the Pentagon and continued to sanction Russia and sell weapons to Ukrainian militias. Putin's invasion of Crimea was surprisingly popular, as the region was majority ethnically Russian. Thus there was far less resistance and the rapid victory gave a big boost for Russian nationalism. By now, it was made clear that the Russian leadership would stop at nothing to prevent countries right beside the Russian border, like Ukraine and Georgia, from falling under Western influence. So you would think that the US and NATO would maybe get the message by now and take less risks. Well, no. Fast forward to 2022, the USA and the new Ukrainian leadership of Zelensky continued flirting with the prospect of joining NATO. And if Ukraine was to join NATO, any little skirmish between Russia and Ukraine's historically contested borders could allow NATO forces to easily attack Russia in minutes. Russia also had other concerns in mind, namely gas pipelines and other economic motives which we'll discuss later in the section on Russian imperialism. So Putin ordered more Russian troops on the Ukraine border and made clear demands that the USA and NATO must not cross Russia's red lines. The Kremlin demanded a guarantee that Ukraine would never be allowed to join NATO and that NATO must halt all military support for Ukrainian militias. Now while it is true that many Ukrainians do genuinely want to join NATO and we should not ignore Ukrainian agency, it is naive to expect that Russia wouldn't react in a hostile way to military expansion by their border. In an ideal world, any country could do what the majority of its people want. However, we are not in an ideal world. We are in a multipolar world with competing imperialist powers. Let's imagine that many Mexicans wanted Mexico to join a military alliance with Russia or China, after being frustrated with the USA continually exploiting them and meddling in their country. Do you really think that the USA would just sit back and allow Chinese or Russian missiles to be right by their border? No way, Jose. Mexico wouldn't dare do such a thing because they would be terrified of the USA's reaction. The USA would probably invade Mexico or start World War III, which they almost did over Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis, as we mentioned earlier. Now, to be absolutely clear, this is not to defend or excuse Russia's invasion of Ukraine. At the end of the day, it was Russia under the leadership of Vladimir Putin who chose to invade Ukraine. And I am certainly not saying that the invasion was justified either. 
After all, following the collapse of the USSR, Ukraine signed a contract with Russia whereby Ukraine gave up all of their nuclear weapons in exchange for Russia respecting their new borders, an agreement that was clearly broken. So it's not just Russia's borders who have been violated, but also Ukraine's. But did Putin really invade Ukraine in response to the threat of NATO expansion? Or was this all part of a master plan he had for years? Does he secretly want to colonize the entirety of Ukraine in order to rebuild the Soviet Union? Or perhaps the Tsarist Russian Empire, as many people have claimed? Ever since the 2014 conflict over Ukraine, Putin and the Kremlin have become more and more explicitly anti-West promoting more messages in Russian state TV against the USA, going as far to even platform leftists in the West to attack the USA. And even though the Russian regime is clearly right-wing itself and by no means leftist, they platform leftists with the purpose of attacking the USA. Which to be fair has been very advantageous to many leftist intellectuals and activists in the USA, as they do not get platformed at all in corporate mainstream media. So as diplomatic ties between Moscow and Washington became ever more fractured, the Kremlin began moving towards an ideology that would coincide with their anti-Western political stance. Rather than opposing the West from an anti-capitalist standpoint, the Putin regime's new state ideology centered on anti-liberalism. It was a deeply conservative ideology, which gave the regime a whole new reason for its existence, allowing the Putin administration to maintain power for far longer than most expected. Now I would like to thank all my patrons, especially these generous people. One Dime is an entirely fan-funded project. If you have enough money for Netflix, then why not pledge a couple of dollars on Patreon to help support your favorite independent content creators? So if you want to help support the work I do on the One Dime channel and the One Dime radio podcast, then consider becoming a patron. See you in the next video.